So we, uh, we picked the title for our presentation because some of the issues that are associated with assessing depredation are probably more acute in a small fishery such as the Falkland Islands. The Falkland Islands, we have one single quota currently at 1,040 tons fished by one single vessel at a time. And that kind of situation limits the opportunities for comparing depredation among long line sets in both space and time. And of course, this is particularly a problem with respect to the question of invisible depredation. A line comes up with the hook missing, and then how do you know whether there was ever a fish on it to begin with, and how do you assess that kind of depredation? So in order to deal with this, we've been looking at the data that we have available, starting with our observer data. Since 2002, longline observers have been employed by the Fisheries Department in the Falkland Islands, although their specific mandate has been to monitor seabird mortalities. Initially, 75% of observer time was spent on seabird interaction monitoring on the water, 25% on biological catch sampling. Over time, this has been gradually reduced as seabird mortality has declined in the fishery. So basically, we have the situation where it, the observer coverage was not about whales to begin with, but nevertheless, opportunities for whale monitoring are there. The observers that are out there can look at the presence or absence of whales and their interactions and record these during the seabird observation periods. And as well, the observers can characterize what kind of depredation is happening, whether it's a fish being actually bitten off, like the one on the left, or a fish being infested with scavengers such as hagfish, like the, the picture on the lower right. And then these kinds of data, these kinds of uh, records are summarized by the observers in tables that are produced and included in the report for each trip. And then at the end of a trip, when the observer comes back to the fisheries department, the data are screened and uploaded onto the server. And from that point, these data are available for us to perform analysis on. It starts with a depredation main form. That's the, uh, the small one you see right there. And uh, this depredation main form is linked to a subsidiary form that records uh, information such as the numbers of specimens that were observed, what kind of condition they were in, what, uh, what set and what number of hooks they were associated with, and so forth. And then also the largest form on this page is a kind of a survey form just for estimating bird and whale abundance. So with these kinds of data available in the fisheries department, we can then start on the job of estimating depredation by performing comparisons among long line sets. And at this point, we've made a definition that we consider long line sets to have had no interaction if no fish on the line at all were reported damaged or destroyed. And then we define as whale interaction long line sets those sets on, uh, on which at least one fish of any species was reported damaged or destroyed, which is reported by comments such as heads or lips or gills being left on some of the hooks. So the idea there is that whales are probably kind of messy eaters. They're not going to strip a line completely clean. Even if most of the depredation is invisible depredation, there will always be a few traces left that you can look at. And then the additional criterion is that these damage reports must not have been overtly reported as coming from other animals such as sharks or crustaceans or hagfish scavengers. So with these uh, criteria in hand, what we currently have in our database is 1,948 observed longline sets from 2004 to 2015. Of these, 296 have been determined as whale interaction sets and the other 1,652 as no interaction sets. We then compare these. So far we've been looking at two approaches, comparison by proximity and by applying predictive models. So proximity to begin with, we've defined proximate long line sets to be those that are within two days and six kilometers average separation distance of each other. And by this criterion, of the 296 whale interaction sets, 105 of them were found to have at least one 
no interaction set within the defined range that could then be matched in a comparison. When we then ran our comparison, we used again the criterion of catch per unit effort, defined either in terms of the catch weight, the kilograms, or the numbers of toothfish per hooks. And then we found that among these sets, there was no statistically significant difference if we used a paired t-test. And this is the kind of situation where you really do find yourself limited by having a small fishery with just one vessel doing the fishery at a time. In the end, over a 10-year period, you only have 105 sets that you can compare, so it ends up not being statistically powerful enough to really estimate the depredation. So then we switch to looking at predictive models. And we've been running a simple generalized linear models on our data, which evaluate the toothfish catch in terms of predictive covariates, such as the year, the month, the vessel, the depth, the haul duration, the number of hooks, the soak time, latitude, longitude, and the gear method. And by gear method, we mean whether the long line was using either the Spanish or the umbrella system. And as Janet presented yesterday in her talk, in the Falcon Islands fishery, the umbrella system has been used since July of 2007. Then we calculate our generalized linear models two ways. First of all, using only those sets that were defined as having no whale interaction. And then second, we recalculate the GLM, and this time using all the long line sets. And what we do with that then is project the model predictions from either GLM back onto all the sets. So the idea here is that if you don't have enough information to compare different long line sets with each other, then instead what you can do is basically compare long line sets with themselves as a function of projecting different model predictions onto them. And in terms of results, again, we did this for toothfish catch numbers as well as catch weight. So starting with catch numbers uh, modeled on a Poisson distribution for count data, we found that toothfish catches were significantly correlated with the year, the month, the vessel, the depth, and the longitude. For the GLM using only no interaction sets, this gave an R-squared value of 30.5%. The GLM using all line line sets a little bit higher at 33.0. And uh, so what we found is that we have significant models, but the predictive value is not that high. There's still a lot of variability that can't be explained by the covariates. Similar for toothfish catch in terms of kilograms, this time modeled on a Gaussian distribution. Again, most of the significant covariates were the same ones, year, month, vessel, depth, and longitude, but this time also soak time was found to be significant. And the GLMs using no interaction sets this time had a slightly higher R-square, 31%. GLMs using all long line sets, 32.7% R-square. So basically the same range of predictive value. And then we started uh, looking at some comparisons for this. In terms of toothfish catch numbers for long line sets that actually had no interaction, we found that the predicted numbers were about equal with either GLM, with either the GLM from all sets or the GLM from only no interaction sets. There was not a statistically significant difference. However, if we then, then did this for those long line sets that actually did have whale interaction in terms of the criteria that we, found, we defined it turns out that the predicted numbers from the GLM with all sets is significantly higher than the predicted numbers from the GLM with no interaction sets only. So what this implies is that long line sets attended by whales have more toothfish. And that's not surprising because it corroborates what other people have already been saying in this workshop, that namely that sperm whales feed naturally on toothfish. Um, Specifically, I took this information from one of the papers by Tixie et al. And in the Falkland Islands, we have the situation that most whales are sperm whales. So it makes sense that you would get the highest catch numbers of toothfish where there are the most whales. And then if we do the same kind of analysis, this time using toothfish catch weight, we found that for long line sets that actually had whale interaction, the predicted kilograms of catch were about equal whether you were 
making the prediction with the GLM from all sets or with a no interaction GLM difference was not statistically significant. But in this case, if you looked at the long line sets that actually div, did have no interaction in accordance with the criteria, the predicted kilograms of catch were significantly lower from the GLM with all sets compared to the GLM with no interaction sets only. So what this implies is that toothfish catch weight is significantly reduced on long line sets attended by whales. Despite the contrasting bias of there being higher numbers of toothfish in the presence of whales. And again, that's not surprising because it has been found that both killer whales and sperm whales will selectively retrieve larger sized fish from the lines. I took this quote uh, from a paper by Guinet et al, 2014. So if you have whales uh, around your long lines, you can expect that there will be higher numbers of toothfish, but at the same time, the total catch weight will be significantly reduced because the whales are picking off the bigger ones. So the next step then is to take these kinds of differences and evaluate them with respect to the model predictions between the all sets or the no interaction GLMs. And at this point, we've taken the simple approach of just subtracting one set of predictions from the other and then plotting those subtractions, those differences, versus the covariates of the models, the covariates such as the longitude, the depth, and so forth. And uh, for these next plots that I'm going to show, it's for the GLM by catch weight in terms of kilograms, and for the no interaction sets, which had the significant difference. So here, this graph shows the predicted kilograms of the GLM with no interaction, minus the predicted kilograms from the GLM for all sets. And these are the difference data. You can see they go from positive numbers of about 600 to negative numbers of minus 400 versus the depth in meters. And what you can see on this graph is that there's a very noticeable decline going towards the shallower depths. We ran a nonlinear model over that, which was highly significant. <clears throat> indicating that depredation occurs less in shallower waters. So the whales apparently do their work primarily in depths that are greater than 1,000 meters. If we then take the same difference data, and this time plot them versus longitude, with a shallow but statistically significant slope, indicating that in our fishing zone around the Falkland Islands, depredation occurs more to the west. And then again, again, taking the same data, this time plotting them versus the soak time in days, we found that depredation increases slightly with the soak time, which is probably not surprising. The effect is quite small over two days, but then we also have few data over two days. And then the last plot that I'm going to show is versus the month of the fishery, and this indicated that Relatively speaking, whale depredation was not significantly different by month from the model differences. There's a certain amount of variability, but the variability is not greater than the variability within months. So overall, there's no evident month effect. So these are the kinds of preliminary analysis that we've been looking at so far. And what this has shown us at this point is that in a small fishery, such as, the, such as the Falkland Islands, which has limited data for comparing different long lines, because we have only vessel, one vessel at a time, an approach like this, model differencing, can potentially provide a means to estimate depredation, in particular the kind of depredation that is invisible and that can't be recorded directly. So the next step of the work that we have to do is see if we can potentially come up with more accurate approaches, to inferring what really are interaction versus non-interaction sets. So far, this has been kind of a rough estimate only. And uh, for this, we're going to be working more closely with our industry partner to take the axis of what data they have. And then the uh, further step is to quantify the differences in potential invisible depredation with respect to the covariates, such as the longitude and the depth so that we can make reasonable estimates of where or when invisible depredation is mostly occurring. And then we also have to offset that <clears throat> with respect to the biasing factor of there being higher toothfish catch numbers occurring with the whale presence. 
And it's for this kind of calculation that we have coming up <clears throat> that I particularly hope to get some feedback from this uh, workshop and some, I some ideas and suggestions on how to proceed. Thank you.